The Interstate 5 bridge over the Columbia River sees nearly 50 million vehicles every year, but its aging design and structure, combined with the risk of earthquakes, make replacing it unavoidable. What some believe should be a straightforward project has turned into a $6 billion controversy, coined as the Interstate Bridge Replacement. With a rising cost, new tools on a once free crossing, and fierce debates over design and features, it's easy to see why this would get a lot of attention. Will this be the solution the Pacific Northwest desperately needs, or will it spark even more challenges along the way? Spanning the Columbia River, the I-5 bridge is a critical link between Oregon and Washington, connecting Portland and Vancouver. As the only continuous north-south interstate on the west coast, it supports over 130,000 vehicles daily, including significant freight traffic. Essential industries like agriculture, technology, and manufacturing depend heavily on this bridge, making it a vital piece of the region's economic infrastructure. Structurally, the original bridge featured 13 steel spans, three of which were 275 feet long, while the remaining 10 were slightly shorter at 265 feet. Piers were supported by wooden pilings driven approximately 70 feet into the riverbed. A key feature was the lift span, a section that could rise 136 feet to allow river traffic to pass, providing a total clearance of 176 feet when fully raised. The towers of the bridge that support the lift span stand 190 feet tall. The bridge originally opened in February 1917, with the cost of $1.75 million, or roughly $42 million in today's money. The bridge's original deck was designed with practicality in mind. It featured a 38-foot wide roadway and a sidewalk measuring 5 feet across. As the first automobile bridge across the Columbia River between Washington and Oregon, it played a crucial role in the region's development, originally charging a toll of 5 cents per vehicle. In 1928, the states of Washington and Oregon purchased the bridge, and tolls were eliminated the following year. As traffic increased post-World War II, with over 30,000 vehicles crossing daily by 1948, a second span was proposed to alleviate congestion. This new span, built parallel to the original bridge, opened in 1958 at a cost of $14.5 million, which, adjusted for inflation, would be around $153 million today. The second span featured a humpback design, allowing for 72 feet of clearance without the need for frequent lifts. Following its completion, the original bridge was closed temporarily to undergo similar modifications. In its current form, the bridge spans just over 3,500 feet, with a main lift span of 531 feet. The lift mechanism provides 175 feet of clearance, with openings lasting around 10 minutes. The lift span still operates regularly, opening roughly 20 to 30 times per month to accommodate river traffic. One of the key reasons for constructing the new bridge is to improve its earthquake resilience. The current structure is vulnerable to significant damage or collapse if a major earthquake occurs. As I mentioned earlier, some of its foundations rest on wooden pilings driven into the sandy riverbed, which poses a serious risk in the event of seismic activity. And given its location within the Cascadia subduction zone, where earthquakes as strong as magnitude 9.0 are possible, upgrading the bridge is crucial to ensure safety and stability. Another reason for the new bridge is to decrease traffic. Daily traffic and congestion averages over four hours during peak times. This congestion, along with bridge lifts, slow down freight carrying goods along I-5, and this is one of the only stops on the entire interstate from Canada to Mexico. Additionally, the bridge's limited walkways and lack of dedicated lanes hinder safe travel for pedestrians and cyclists. As of October 2024, the official design for the Interstate Bridge Replacement, or IBR, has not yet been finalized. There are six total designs that are being considered. One such design is the Extradose Bridge, which features low towers and cables that don't intrude into the airspace of the nearby Portland International Airport or Pearson Airfield. Similar in concept is the Finback Bridge, which replaces cables with concrete encased fins while also keeping towers below the required limits. The concrete bridge design resembles the Glen Jackson Bridge, utilizing concrete supports for larger spans, while the steel girder bridge opts for a lighter structure with the same overall shape. Additionally, the truss bridge design incorporates two levels, with a highway on top and public transit and pedestrian lanes underneath, maintaining a slimmer profile and also avoiding airspace issues. Lastly, the movable bridge features a lift span to accommodate maritime traffic, necessitating dredging to allow for sufficient clearance. The IBR group also did a study on creating a tunnel, but according to their estimates, it would have been too expensive and there were concerns about soil stability and environmental disruption. One of the main concepts of the bridge is to try and make it multimodal, including pedestrian bike lanes and public transit. According to IBR, this will also help significantly reduce the amount of vehicle traffic over the bridge. A 2023 official cost estimate considered all aspects of the project. 
The estimate ranged from $5 billion to $7.5 billion, with $6 billion being the quote-unquote likely figure. The IBR program will be funded from mechanisms like federal grants, tolling, and state contributions, with current commitments including $2.5 billion in prospective federal grants, $217 million in existing state funding, and $1 billion contributions from both Oregon and Washington. Tolling is expected to raise the final $1.2 billion. The IBR program will use variable rate tolling based on time of the day to generate revenue and manage traffic demand. Several toll scenarios have been studied, including possible discounts for low-income travelers with toll rates projected between $1.50 and $3.55 at the start, although these rates are subject to change. Before diving into this section, I want to emphasize that my goal is to present the facts so you can form your own opinion. After the video, if you have any input, the IBR group is accepting comments through November 18th of 2024, and I'll link the details in the description. While there's universal agreements on the need for a new functional bridge, the controversy lies in the additional developments tied to the project, sparking debate over the design, costs, and broader impacts. To give you some background, there was already an attempt to replace the bridge, called the Columbia River Crossing Project. The project aimed to address the traffic bottleneck on the interstate bridge. Initial estimates range from $2 billion to $3.4 billion, but a 2010 independent study suggested costs could reach as much as $10 billion. By 2008, the locally preferred alternative included a new I-5 bridge with a light rail extension. Vancouver's mayor supported light rail integration as a cost-effective link to Portland, but concerns about environmental impacts, suburban sprawl, and rising costs led to opposition. In 2013, Washington stopped funding, and Oregon shut down the project. Then in 2017, the IBR project was announced. Some people claim that Oregon and Washington highway builders had rebranded the failed Columbia River Crossing as a bridge replacement project, but less than 30% of the multi-billion dollar cost was for the actual bridge. The replacement itself was estimated at the time to be somewhere between 500 million to 1 billion, with much of the total expense going toward widening the freeway and rebuilding distant interchanges. This was a claim made back in 2022. However, by 2024, the cost figure has escalated to approximately 6 billion dollars. Another issue is with the tolls, and as it stands today, there are none on the existing bridge. An investment-grade analysis tied to the previous project indicated that even a $3 toll could permanently reduce traffic on I-5 to under 90,000 vehicles per day. This could increase strain on the nearby Glen Jackson Bridge located just six miles away, while also leading to more traffic on other roads throughout Portland and Vancouver. Another issue is the current bridge rises to 176 feet when fully lifted, and the US Coast Guard has signaled reluctance to approve a permit for the new project if it doesn't maintain that level of river clearance. And considering the current modified locally preferred alternative would cross the main channel at 116 feet, you could see why this could be a major issue. While this final section highlighted some drawbacks of the bridge, it's clear that a new structure is ultimately necessary, a point both sides of the debate acknowledge. The real discussion centers on the design and the surrounding developments associated with the project. If it does receive approval, this is the general timeline we can expect moving forward. Assuming it does get approved, it's going to be an impressive project in scale no matter what. And who knows, maybe I'll cover the construction in the future. I want to thank you for watching the video and ask that you please consider leaving some feedback. If you've been watching my videos, you know that I've been able to travel to these projects in person a lot more often, and that can all be traced back to the support you give to the channel. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.